Hello. From this true European entrepreneur who mixes up Silicon Valley, we go another truly to another truly DLD stars combination. During the last days, we touched many times on the topic of data and democracy, because this is a never-ending vital discussion, discussion of our times. How do we deal with the overwhelming dependency from technology companies for our business and our private lives? And furthermore, how do we deal with the fact that these companies are based in Europe are based in Europe, but in the US, US and China. Is digital sovereignty just an illusion? What is the way forward for entrepreneurs and politics? Which guidelines and which alliances do we need? So let's hear from Vivian Redding. She is the former vice president of the European Commission. She served on the EU Commission for 15 years a veteran, a European veteran, responsible for justice, industry, telecommunication, research and technology, education and culture and sports. What a broad range, what an expert, what a role model for Europe, for engagement in Europe. In her life before the EU Commission, Viviane was a journalist, a curious journalist. Curiosity is in her DNA, so is, she is a perfect fit for Stefan Filzmeier, founder and president and CEO of BrainLab, an international leader in medical technology out of Munich. BrainLab's cutting-edge software and hardware improves critical surgeries, radio surgeries, treatments, and operating room efficiencies with devices that create and enhance data, that create and enhance data. Stefan, our friend, has a clear standpoint regarding the use of personal and medical data. So please, Vivian and Stefan, the floor is yours. I'm curious about your combination, about what you have to say, and it's wonderful seeing you so nice and healthy here on this screen. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Stefan. Hello. You are taking over. So I am okay. Yes. So um, I think that uh, talking about uh, democracy and uh, and data, I think it's really important to look at uh, what is really the role of uh, of Europe. And uh, I think if you um, if you look at uh, basically the the data world around us, we are basically somehow squeezed in between maybe the 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 you know, digital systems in Asia and also in the US. But neither one can be a, a concept or role model for Europe. We, we don't really want to adopt the, the concept of uh, data socialism and a state-driven data economy like we see in, in Asia, nor do we believe that the, the concept of um, data capitalism without rules and anything goes that's uh, you know, technically feasible can be a concept for Europe. So, you know, fortunately, I think that uh, the GDPR has basically and uh, you know, you're essentially the, the the mother of GDPR has really laid out the um, all the essential you know elements. However, I think we're struggling with uh, how this is uh, implemented in some of the countries, and we're also uh, struggling with uh, you know some of the uh, new developments um, in uh, in a lot of the uh, you know global big uh, platforms, and that's what we're um, I guess uh, uh, talking to today about. What would be the European role model, and I think there is the concept of a uh, basically um, a data market, uh, you know, social market economy that uh, really um, puts the uh, the citizen and uh, you know the individual in the center. That really implements the the concept of uh, you know um, digital self determination, but uh, nevertheless gives us access to all the benefits of the of the data economy. And uh, yeah, so I'm very excited to have the opportunity to uh, discuss it with you, uh, Viviane. Yeah, well, you have introduced it in a perfect way and you are absolutely right. Uh, Europe is neither China nor uh, United States. And that is why we could be the perfect uh, bridge builder, uh, maybe, uh, if we would all sit together and try to find a solution. Because in one thing we are 
together very clearly. And that is uh, the uh, next uh, generations. We live in a data society. We already do. 90% of the available data has been created in the last two years, and there is an exponential growth, which simply uh, said is the one who controls the data controls the world. And uh, we do not want to be controlled by anybody in Europe. We want to have our own rules, rules which leave the society to have the quality of life which we enjoy, uh, thanks God, in Europe. Uh, respect the individual. Uh, that is in our DNA and it is in our treaties that law always has to put the protection of the individual in the center and in the meantime also uh, be a pro uh, evolution a pro imagination pro doing things so how you bring these three things together and i think a good, very good example uh, was uh, the, um, the gdpr um, data protection rules so GDPR is not only about protect, protecting the personal data, it is also about having one rule for one continent for all those who operate on this continent. And that's the way we proceed. We are masters on our continent, we leave everybody in, but if you come in, you have to apply our rules and our rules always implement the protection and the respect of uh, values and of the individual. And that is also the way we are going to proceed in the future. And if you look at uh, the uh, discussion about GDPR, it's not always uh, you know, positive, but that's basically mostly a function of uh, you know, how it has been implemented by a lot of the states. And I think if you look at the, the concepts, it's actually something that is becoming to be a role model for a number of different countries like California and different other states have uh, adopted some of the principles. And if you also look at the, uh, the new leg legislation that's uh, in the pipeline, the, dig the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, I think it, it really is uh, setting the foundation for a quite uh, you know, brilliant framework. However, the challenge is really how it is implemented in some of the member states. They're not really taking and using the full potential of the GDPR using some of these uh, you know, opening clauses and uh, you know, being German, I think that Germany is in a particular bad state and um, we, uh, we have basically um, you know, regionalized uh, the oversight and if you look at all the different states, the different states laws, the different hospital laws, the Catholic and the Protestant uh, hospitals and uh, you know, um, if you put it all together you have basically 100 different people you know, overlooking the entire system and uh, I think the fact that uh, Germany is a bit of a lame duck in implementing the GDPR by over-regulating it, I think is basically a bit of a, um, of a threat to the overall idea. And this is really something that where we need to take action on. If we talk about what the world needs now, we need to um, basically um, resolve that uh, challenge really quickly so that we can really take the full um, you know, potential of the GDPR. And, uh, but looking at uh, basically the, the, the balance between uh, regulation and, uh, and uh, data economy, I think this is also getting a little bit out of balance. We're talking a lot about how to protect our, our freedom, but we can't protect our freedom in terms of data if we don't have a digital economy that's developing at the pace we need. If there's uh, no data to protect, then um, basically that's a challenge. And of course, we don't need to protect the data. We need to protect the citizens in their life circumstances. And uh, so therefore, I think uh, if we talk about, again, what the world needs now, we need to become better in stimulating um, the development of the digital economy in, in Europe. I absolutely agree with you and I absolutely agree most of all uh, when you say that the idea of uh, the GDPR, which is an idea of freedom of movement for companies and for individuals, has been uh, burdened uh, by an interpretation in some member states which goes to the nitty-gritty instead of looking at the overall. But the fact that GDPR has become some kind of a gold standard worldwide shows that we are in the right direction. And I think we should continue in this right direction. For instance, you said um, uh, we need to have 
the data? Well, 75% of the world data, um, be it personal data or on, uh, on, on platforms or industrial data, is between uh, Europe and the United States. And uh, if you look at this figure, and if you know that uh, nevertheless the values which we apply in our societies in the United States and in Europe are somehow the same, then I do believe we should get our acts together, seek together in order instead of fighting and finding the rules which will regulate, not over-regulate, but bring the legal certainty and the transparency to this new society of the data. So I have heard the speeches of the new president of the United States, and I do believe that there is a possibility, there should be a possibility, there must be a possibility that the two continents sit together and build the rules for the future. We absolutely have to work together. And I think that that's a whole concept of digital technology that it can scale. And if you basically you know, have a, a fight of systems, then that will screw up the scalability of digital technology. But I would also maybe disagree that uh, despite the fact of having some maybe um, overarching uh, similar values, there's still substantial differences in the United States. And I want to talk about healthcare because that's the area that I'm uh, most familiar with. So, um, for example, in, in healthcare in the U.S., it's uh, basically in the new leg legislation for patients, um, you know, possible to, uh, to get the direct access with a digital interface to their data, and they can give it and share it with everybody without any rules and any regulation. And uh, if you look at how uh, big platform companies are now um, entering the healthcare market, if you look at, you know, Amazon with, uh, uh, they're combining their wearable halo with, um, a life insurance, uh, they have an online pharmacy, they um, are offering already to uh, their employees and others um, basically health insurance. And um, I don't think that that's basically in line with, uh, you know, our Euro philosophy is the same in Asia. If you have your chat function, your, um, your bank account and all of that in the same company, they think it's super convenient. But uh, I, I'm, I'm very worried about um, uh, this in, in Europe. And I think if we don't um, act now, then I think we're going to be facing a situation that is not in line with European values. And uh, that's very much concerning me. So, you know, what's your position on that? Yes, my position on this is that I am as concerned as, as you. And you are right, because we have a different system built up. In the United States, it's a company which rules. In Europe, it is the rules which rules. In the United States, the rules are made or not, or unmade by the companies. In Europe, the rules are made by the elected uh, um, lawmakers. So that makes the first difference. The second difference is that because we want to have a quality of life which is shared by all citizens, we have uh, our social systems for health. And that is part of the quality of life, not to have people left out, not to have the poor who have a, a less good uh, um, a medical care uh, than the less poor. And we are going to preserve that, because if we would give that up in Europe, we would give up uh, being what we are. Uh, and that is also why we need the rules. We need yeah. very clear rules, most of all on the most sensitive uh, data a person has, and these are the health uh, data. Uh, so uh, here the policy has to come in very quickly, very strongly, also because of the development of AI, uh, which will take over a part of the uh, way of behaving. I must not tell you because you are uh, the big specialist in uh, knowing what to do in a positive, in a constructive, in a respectful uh, way with uh, the health data of the individual. So this is something to be uh, cared for in our, in preserving our European way of life. Yeah, I think the threat to our democracy is a situation where, for example, a patient has been in a hospital, is being dismissed, and uh, as the patient drives off the, the parking lot, um, that person might get, the patient might get the first uh, basically advertising on their phone from Google, which basically knows which hospital they have been, how long they've been there, probably what they've been treated for, 
because of their search uh, you know, results. And uh, I personally think, therefore, um, I, I, I really think that I love um, basically all the digital platforms. And I think that, um, you know, Google, you know, Amazon, Microsoft all made a massive contribution to, um, to our society, et cetera, by providing really big and important um, scalable platforms. However, what is a threat is the combination across multiple, um, you know, business um, segments. And I think this is like what's worrying me to combine the super sensitive healthcare data on the one hand with data that's used for um, creating profiles like um, search engine um, results, um, language processing or, or, or positional data. And I think that what the world needs now is a clear separation Chinese walls where um, I think if a company is processing healthcare data, they can only process healthcare data, but no data for uh, creating profiles and the other way around. And I think if we don't act now, um, um, we will lose our digital sovereignty in, in healthcare, to give an example. But the same can also be um, adopted to probably other critical you know, segments of, uh, of, uh, of our digital life. And I think this is um, what, uh, um, what we see now. And in the current pandemic, the um, digital transformation has really accelerated. So this is something where we need to act now. And we have to act on the basis of the law. And the law already exists. The personal data in Europe belongs to the person, does not belong to a company. And if I freely, with my personal data, uh, want that a company gets it, I can also de decide for what purpose, not for everything, not for selling it, not for uh, uh, running behind of me. And no, uh, I am the person who has its personal data. And you see, in our European market, I call it the market because it is the interest for the companies, it's not the individual, it is the market. But on this whole market, this rule is a basic rule, is a constitutional rule. We're not going to give it up, but the implementation of this rule in praxis needs a very good control. So I am appealing to the data protection authorities. Instead of going to the nitty gritty of this football club has contacted this person or not, they should really look at the platforms and the way they proceed with the data. I'm very glad that in the European pipeline, there are several uh, regulations underway, uh, which will give more possibilities and more power to the regulators in order to see that data is used in a positive, in a legal way, in order to solve problem and that it doesn't create problems to the individual. Yeah, and I think that, um, yeah, the um, if you look at the the way of how um, data is being processed or, or how to how to go about that, uh, the GDPR calls for privacy by design. And I think that's what I'm, um, you know, suggesting. Um, that basically by you know implementing that separation that would exactly drive this. Um, another point yeah, is. Yeah, interrupt I think, you a moment there. Yeah. Can you imagine how much money will be preserved if companies go to uh, uh, privacy by design? For the simple reason, now what do these big companies do? They invest millions into lobbying in order to stop the law instead of applying the law, gaining confidence of the consumers and having all this money for other purposes. So uh, privacy by design would be a real business builder in Europe, I do believe. Yeah, and I think that um, I also believe the lobbying efforts of the big platform companies in Brussels are a true problem because they basically this way get a visibility where basically a lot of these startups and cool tech companies don't have necessarily the lobby. They're not in industry associations. They don't have a platform. But so I'm grateful for DLD being such a platform, giving basically small companies similar to big companies a voice and an opportunity to uh, basically contribute and participate um, basically in a discussion eye to eye. And, uh, you know, that's also what the world uh, basically needs now. But I think in order to make a GDPR also more practical for many businesses, I think it would be great to um, get in certain uh, basically uh, market segments such as healthcare, a code of conduct uh, you know, implemented that basically really sets predictable rules. Because I think that if we really take the GDPR as a, as, as a benefit and uh, basically once we have built a, a digital platform, 
then I really believe it can be a an, an export hit um, to the world. And um, you know, we as a, as Brain Lab um, are you know maybe sometimes struggling um, with the, the challenges. But once we solved something and came up with a better way of doing that, of preserving privacy, then I really think that we have um, developed something that can be um, of uh, of major importance and something that the whole world probably should and will adopt at some point. I propose to Steffi something very concrete that next year in DLD, when we come together again, uh, the small companies, the big companies, the politicians, uh, the, uh, the, the professors of university, that we have something in hand, uh, uh, something which uh, puts down the rules of confidence, the rules and the values, also to have AI inside in this uh, handling of uh, the data. The work has already been done uh, by uh, the uh, AI um, uh, ethical uh, management groups. So we can take this and adapt it in a very concrete way to this very sensitive uh, data uh, for healthcare. And I think that the, um, the, the coronavirus has shown us that this cannot be done in one place and not in another. We have, if we want to survive, if we want to strong, be strong, if we want to take advantage of the possibilities of a data world, we have to work together. And that is why I say let's try to show the world how one works together and DLD will be the very good ground to go ahead with this. Absolutely. And whenever the world is changing and it changed more rapidly, it feels like the last 12 months than ever, then that's an, a tremendous opportunity. And I think it's you know, really up to all of us to basically take that opportunity and uh, you know, work on basically creating um, a better world together. And to, you know, I'm really excited having had the opportunity to discuss it with you. Vivian, um, Stefan and I will immediately invite you to Munich and we start to, pro to writing down your proposal and we, we will have at the end of some weeks, we have a very good paper and we will present it the earliest time we can have. Okay? Great. Great. I think that it's is so necessary. Works. Thank you for making it happen. Ah, Vivian, you're my star. You know this. You know this. Been many years. And yeah. Stefan as well. I learned from you so much. You're such a um, wonderful human being with doing so many good things. And you have really a vision. And this makes me really um, looking into the future in a good way. So we do, we get together at DLD as soon as possible and we have a beautiful, important, relevant paper together. Okay. Great. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Have thank a you. good thank evening. You, have a good afternoon. Ciao. And thank you for everything. Steffi, you are great. And let me, just let me say one thing. You are, you're both, the backgrounds of your both are amazing. You, Jan, you are so European. I love it. I love the, the picture, the painting behind you. I love your outfit, your earrings. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Ciao. Sorry, I have Ciao. to say this because oh. this is, you know, this is what we do between friends. We, 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 ciao, ciao, ciao.